Chapter 19 is about sample surveys and some of the better ways we can design our surveys and complete our surveys. So for example, 193, let's say an investigator wishes to know what percentage of voters in the U.S. will vote Republican in the next election. So this is a type of a question we might, <coughs> might want to answer. So first we need to know about populations and parameters. So in order to ensure that our data is collected, the data that we collect appropriately addresses our question, we would first identify the population of interest. So a population is the group of individuals we are interested in. And when we say the group of individuals we are interested in, make sure you know that this would be all the individuals that we are interested in. And the parameter could be any numerical fact about the population that we're interested in. A numerical fact could be like the percentage of voters that will vote Republican. And our parameters are usually unknown. The reason why is it's usually difficult to collect data on all of the individuals that we're interested in because there's usually just too many people. And so one of our goals of statistics is to estimate our parameters. So for example, once again, if we have our investigator that wants to know what percentage of voters in the U.S. will vote Republican in the next election, the population is going to be the voters in the U.S. Now make a note here once again that this is all the voters in the U.S. That's the keyword here when you think of the population. Remember, it's for all the people you're interested in. The parameter would be the percentage of U.S. voters who will vote Republican in the next election. <coughs> or for a further example, a real estate agent wants to know the average length of time a home in Cache Valley took to sell in the last year. So first, what is the population? It would be all the homes in Cache Valley that were sold last year. And for the parameter, the parameter is some numerical fact that you're interested in with the population. The numerical fact that we're interested in is the average length of time. So the average length of time to sell a home in Cache Valley last year. So the parameter again is the average length of time. Now we'll talk about samples and statistics. So typically it's not feasible to collect data from every individual in a given population. It's too expensive, too time consuming, etc. So instead of collecting data on every subject and population, data is collected for a subset of the population or a sample, so a smaller part. <coughs> So the sample is a smaller group of the population that we collect data on. So see, the population is our big circle. The sample is the smaller subcircle. Okay, and our statistic is a value calculated from the sample. So notice, look carefully, population and parameter both start with P, so you can remember they go together. Sample and statistic both start with S, so you can remember that they go together. What we're going to do is we'll use statistics to estimate our parameters. So we use our sample data to estimate data about our entire population. So we can use our sample statistics to draw conclusions about our population parameters. That should say population parameters. And the science of deducing properties of a population from our sample data is known as statistical inference. Now the question that should be on everyone's mind is, is our sample statistic going to be a good estimate of our population parameter? Otherwise, there's not much point in doing it. So for ex problem 196, this is just to tell you what is the question we're interested in. The whole point of statistics is, is our estimate of the percentage of U.S. voters who will vote Republican going to be accurate? We want to make sure that we choose a good sample so that our estimate of the percentage of U.S. voters will be accurate. Well, how can you choose a good sample? When a sample is chosen, a statistic calculated from that sample, sorry, when a sample is poorly chosen, a statistic calculated from that sample is a poor estimate of the population parameter, so if they're poorly chosen. 
So we need to make sure we choose samples that are representative of our populations. If our samples are representative of the population, then our statistics will be good estimates of our parameters. And how do you, what does a representative sample mean? A representative sample is like the population in ways that matter, or the sample is similar to the population. That's what we mean by a representative sample. And a good sampling procedure will be fair and impartial. So now we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls of choosing samples, some of the ways we can make mess up. One of the first is bias. Bias is any systematic error in an estimate. So something that affects you the same way over and over again. So for this example, in 1976, the advice columnist Ann Landers described the results of a survey in which she said she asked her readers to respond to the question, if you had to do it over again, would you have children? And 70% of the 10,000 responses she received were negative. And you might look at this and say, she received 10,000 responses. That's a lot of responses, so she's probably accurate. But that might not be true. So let's keep going. 70% <clears throat> of the responses were negative. So 70% of people were saying they wouldn't have kids if they had to do it over again. And this column appeared in over 1,200 newspapers in the U.S. and Canada. So because it was going to 1,200 newspapers throughout U the U.S. and Canada, we might think that it went to a lot of different people, and a lot of people responded. But let's dig a little bit deeper. <clears throat> so first is a preliminary. What was the population of interest? Who are we interested in? So she was interested in all the parents in U.S. and Canada. And the parameter is we're looking for the percentage of all parents in U.S. and Canada that would have kids again. That's the number that she's interested in. Now, here comes the question, though. Do you think the Ann Lander sample adequately represented the population? And the answer to this is no. So her sample does not represent the population. And what happens here is you need to know a few things that tend to happen. So first of all, her survey only went to the people who read her column. It might have went to a lot of people, but it was only to the people that read her column. So maybe her readers are more cynical. I don't know what she was like. Maybe she was a very cynical and negative person, so maybe her readers are more cynical and negative. I don't really know. That's just a possibility. And so it's only to the people that read her column. So maybe, let's just continue our line of thought, maybe people who read her column are different somehow than the rest of all parents. Maybe, maybe not, but they're probably different in a, some way. But here's the thing that really comes into play. So, typically, not always, but typically, people, or let's put this way, only people who are really passionate actually care enough to mail something in. So if it's going to take an effort for someone to respond to your survey, only people that are more passionate are going to care enough to make the effort. And not only are the people that are only the passion people going to care, but um, negative people are even more likely to make the effort. So just the fact that her readers had to respond and mail in the survey means that only the passion people are going to do it and negatively passion people are even more likely to do it. <clears throat> if 
For some reason, people just like to complain. And so because of those reasons, her sample didn't actually represent the population. Now let's talk about selection bias. Selection bias is any systematic tendency on the part of a sampling procedure to exclude one kind of person or another from the sample. And this often occurs if the sample is self-selected. So let's make ourselves a note here that this, uh, with Ann Landers, it was self-selected. Self-selected just means that the people involved decide if they want to actually respond or not. Okay, so we have selection bias if the sample is self-selected or if there's any human judgment in picking the sample. So for example, 198, in 1936, samples for predicting the presidential election were chosen using telephone books. And the poor didn't have telephones, so there was a bias against the poor. And so the selection of the sample was biased. For our next example, today many people don't have landlines. So if we were to select a sample of people using a telephone book, what groups of people might we be excluding? So the first one I thought of is almost all college students. Most of them don't have a landline, and even if they happen to have a landline in their apartment, I doubt that their name is listed in the phone book. Also, people who only have cell phones. That would be me. Or people who are too poor for phones. Okay. Any of those groups, and maybe you can think of even more groups, but all of those groups would be excluded. In our next example, the Herald Journal conducts online polls, and a person visiting their website can vote on the question of the week. So what is a possible source of selection bias, or what groups of people might be less likely to see the poll? So the people that are less likely to see the poll. Who is not likely to see the poll? Any people who don't have the internet? It could be older people who don't have or know how to use the internet. It could be people who don't read that particular website or don't look at news at all, and maybe you can think of any more. But these people would be less likely to see the poll. <clears throat> and let's see, people who don't have internet, so maybe all the poor people are less likely to have the internet. Now let's also talk about non-response bias. So non-response bias is bias introduced by important differences between people who respond and people who do not respond. And this is after you invite them to be part of your survey and then they decide whether or not they want to participate. Let's make ourselves a note of that. Once again, you invite them to be part of your survey and they decide whether or not to participate. <clears throat> so in general, the non-respondents can be very different from people who do respond. For example, we found in the past that lower income and upper income people both tend to not respond to questionnaires. So the middle class is actually overrepresented. Also, we found if you interview people at home, that women are more likely to answer the phone. And people who are not at home when the interviewer calls may be different from those who are at home. So maybe their working hours or social background, etc. Or if you let people choose to participate in a survey, so something online where it's the click and poll or mail in surveys, etc., people who take the time to respond also often care much more than the general population. And they often feel differently about the population about the issue than the general population does as well. And once again, negative or people with negative opinions are more likely 
to make the effort. So passionate people are more likely and then negative opinions are even more likely than positive opinions. <clears throat> So here's a really good example of bias. So do you remember when we talked about the a couple minutes ago, Ann Landers had 70% of parents would not do it again. So there's one survey. Now let's consider three more surveys that ask the same question. So in 1976, the magazine Good Housekeeping asked its readers to respond to the question, if you had to do it over again, would you have children? And now 95% of the responses were negative. Now the Kansas City Star randomly chose and contacted 409 people from the Kansas City area and asked the question, if you had to do it over again, would you have children? And 94% now said that they would. So we went from 70% and 95% negative to now 94% positive. So that's 94% positive now. Why is there such a big difference from 95% negative to 94% positive? And the newspaper Newsday conducted a national survey of randomly selected participants in which they asked the question. And of the 1,300 responses to the survey, 91% were affirmative. So we have here again 70% and 95% negative, and then 94% and 91% positive. So why do you think these results were so different? That just, it doesn't make any sense, right? Why is there such a big difference? Okay, and the reason comes down to how did they choose their samples? It's all in the way they chose their samples. So specifically for Ann Landers and the good housekeeping, the survey only went to their readers. And maybe once again their readers already didn't like children. Okay. And the readers had to put forth an effort to actually respond because they had to mail in the survey. So once again, this tells us that maybe their readers are more negative people. Maybe, I don't know this for sure, or don't like children just based on the people they're reading it. Who knows, maybe with the good housekeeping they don't like children messing up their houses. But more specifically, what we do know is that in general, the passionate negative people are more likely to make an effort to respond. Now let's look at the other two. The Kansas City Star randomly chose people and they chose the people and contacted the people and so the people weren't having to make an effort. So there's two things here. So for the Kansas City For Kansas City and Newsday, they randomly selected people. So this way you get a mix of all people and not just the readers. Also, they contacted the people. So it didn't take as much of an effort to respond. And that's why there's such a big difference. And which one has the more accurate results? The Kansas City and Newsday have the more accurate results. <clears throat> and this next example is actually very famous. So in 1936, the Literary Digest took the largest sample ever. 
they took a sample of 2.4 million people and asked them who they were going to vote for in the presidential elected election. And they predicted that Roosevelt would only get 43% of the vote and Landon would win. But Roosevelt won with 62%. And then the Literary Digest actually went bankrupt after this because they predicted it so badly. So they predicted that you'd get 43% and Roosevelt got 62%. So what went wrong? There were a couple things here. So the selection bias, they selected their sample from telephone books and club membership lists. And the poor didn't have phones or belong to the clubs. And... And re Roosevelt was Democrat, which is usually more popular among the poor, plus his platform had a lot of economic policy to help with the Great Depression. So again, for the poor, the ones that don't, couldn't afford phones, or couldn't belong to the clubs, they were really concerned about the economics and more likely to vote for Roosevelt. <clears throat> also, there's this non-response bias. So they mailed questionnaires to 10 million people and only 2.4 million people responded. And we did say before that the poor and rich usually don't bother responding to surveys and so I'm not sure how that worked with the selection bias and the non-response. I don't know what percentage of poor decided not to do it because they had to respond. Okay, so these are two different things that could have happened. And then people with the negative opinions are usually more likely to respond. <clears throat> and then we have a question, are bigger samples better? So it seems like if you look at more people, you should get better results. But this only happens if the sample is representative. So if your sample is a good sample. Okay, then a large sample is better than a small sample because it is going to give more precise estimates of the population parameter. But if your sampling procedure is biased, taking a large sample doesn't help. It just repeats the same mistake over and over and over so you get an even bigger mistake. Okay. But the thing that you'll want to remember here is that if you have a good sample, If you have a good sample, then bigger is better. But only if you have a good sample. Then we can talk about types of sampling. So once again, how do we ensure that a sample is representative of the population? So there's different types that we can look at. The first one we're going to do is actually a bad choice. So quota sampling is not a good choice. And an example, in 1948, Thomas Dewey ran for the President of the United States against Harry Truman. And three different, very major, very big polls predicted that Dewey would win the election beating out Truman. And they even printed up the newspapers, but Truman ended up winning by about 5 percentage points. So what happened here? They thought that they'd improved over 1936, they didn't pick their samples from the phone book anymore. But instead what they did is they came up with this process called quota sampling. And it actually sounds really good. So what happens is that interviewers were required to interview a certain number of people in several categories, such as residence, age, and sex. So the interviewers could select anyone they wanted as long as their subjects satisfied the specified criteria. For example, six had to be from the suburbs, seven from the city. And of those, seven had to be men, six women. Of the seven men, three had to be over 40, four, under, four over 40. Of the seven men, six had to be white, one had to be black, etc. And so they had these very specific rules, and what they were trying to do was make sure that the sample is very similar to the population. And so does this seem like a good way to ensure that the sample is representative of the population? And so it turns out that this does sound very good, because you should get similar ratios in the sample and population in regard to gender, age, race, etc. 
But the secret error here that they didn't realize was going to crop up okay, is that the interviewers still have a choice on who to interview as long as they fit the criteria of the quota. And there are many factors that affect the way that someone will vote, and these pollsters didn't have the quota for to control all of these factors. Also, inside the categories, there's a lot of room for human choice. So, for example, maybe Republicans were just easier to interview for some reason, and that's why they had a lot more Republicans, and that's why they predicted that Dewey would win. So again, for our quota sampling, in quota sampling, the subjects are handpicked to resemble the population with respect to some key characteristics. And quota sampling seems reasonable because it ensures that the sample will resemble the population with respect to some of the important characteristics related to voting behavior, such as, again, it's like your gender and your race and where you live. Okay, but sam quota sampling does not work well due to unintentional bias on parts of the interviewer. Now we're going to talk about another poor choice. This is called convenient sampling, named because it's convenient. So su subjects are chosen because of their convenient accessibility to the researcher. This also includes any time you let willing people self-select to be in the study. So this would include all mail-in surveys and click in online polls. Any time where your subjects are selected just because they're easiest to recruit for the study. And convenient samples are almost never representative of the general population. So for example, let's say I want to estimate the percentage of all students on campus who have taken calculus. And I use everyone in this class as a sample. So do you think that the estimate will be accurate? Do you think that the sample is representative of the population? Well, first of all, no. We just know right off that because it is a convenient sample, it probably isn't good. It's a convenient sample because you guys, I have access to all of you. You're very convenient. Let's think about some more reasons that it might not work. So for example, this class doesn't have calculus as a prerequisite. Also, this is a stats class for people that don't really like math. So people in this class are much less likely to have taken calculus. So if I were to use you to estimate the percentage that have taken calculus, I'd probably estimate about 0%. And that's not right. There are people on campus that have taken calculus. But if I went into, say, an engineering class and asked them, then I might get an estimate of, say, 100% because they all have to take calculus. And so convenient samples aren't very good. Instead, what we want to do is probability methods for sampling. So these are our good choices. So a probability method helps us ensure that the sample is representative of the population. And a probability method just means that the elements in the sample should be chosen randomly from the population. And you might choose them randomly by like tossing a coin or putting names in a hat or using computer generated random numbers. Anything with an element of chance. And when probability based sampling methods are used, the interviewers don't have any discretion about whom they interview. So there's absolutely no personal bias. There's no human judgment. Let's talk about a few different probability based methods. So the first one is a simple random sample, sometimes called SRS. So a simple random sample is selected by drawing at random without replacement from the population. Now without replacement because we don't want to draw the same person twice. And by design when you do it this way, every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. 
and simple random sampling is great when it's feasible. However, sometimes, such as in the case of if your population is all the eligible voters in the U.S., it's not practical because the population is too big. Why does it matter how big the population is? Well, to do a simple random sample, you have to have a list of everyone in your population. So you would have to list all the eligible voters in the U.S. That would be almost impossible by itself. But then if everyone has an equal chance of being chosen, you draw like one person from New York and one person from Nevada and one person from Wisconsin, which is good. But again, you're going to have to send interviewers all over the nation since your random sample will be scattered all over. And they're going to be in all these little towns, not even just sending people to each state. So another thing we can do is cluster sampling. Clusters, clusters are things like a household or a block or a neighborhood. So you select, say, neighborhoods at random, and then all the individuals in the selected clusters are sampled. Or a stratified sample divides up the population into groups based on an important variable, for example, age or gender income, and then randomly selects people separately from each group. We have multi-stage cluster sampling, which is where you divide the population into regions. And then you randomly select regions, and then you divide those regions up again and randomly select some of them. And then you divide them up again and randomly select some, and you keep going down and down and down until you just have these random little blocks all throughout the U.S. So for example, when Gallup collects data for a survey, they divide the country into four geographic regions. Northeast, South, Midwest, and West. And then within each region, you divide the population even further into population centers, and they call them wars, precincts, households, and individuals. And so you randomly select these small groups from each of the different clusters, and so you get these random people throughout the entire U.S., but you don't have to look at random people throughout the entire U.S., you look at random people in small little sections of the U.S. And just a few more notes on how difficult it is to get a good sample. So our probability methods attempt to minimize bias, but there are still problems due to things like badly asked questions or interviewer control. Interviewer control being like somehow the interviewer puts a little extra emphasis on the question they want or intimidate the people, something where the interviewer is involved. Or also talk is cheap, so people lie or it's easy to say something but not actually do it. <coughs> so this example is a very good example, or cartoon is a very good example of interviewer control, of if you're asking if how the you feel about paying taxes but there's people surrounding you with clubs and other weapons, you probably won't complain. Now, in summary, the method of choosing a sample matters a lot. An important feature of all the probability samples methods for sampling is that, number one, interviewers have no discretion as to whom they, whom they interview. Number two, there's a definite procedure for selecting the sample. And number three, selecting the sample involves the planned use of chance. Now, even when we have probability methods, the estimate of the parameter is going to differ from the true parameter value due to some bias and chance error. And how accurate our estimates are likely to be is going to be our subject of the next chapter, the next few chapters, actually. <coughs>